last, oh, a couple of months ago, uh, in fact, it was right after we came back from, from India, uh, there was an article that was going around, um, local news. I don't know if you remember it, but it goes something like this, that Singapore was ranked the happiest country in Asia. Do you remember that? You remember the article? The happiest country in Asia, and then we, we are top 25 uh, worldwide, right? Top 25 worldwide out of at least 130 nations that were surveyed. Now, how many of you had something to say, or what did you, what came to mind the first, what was the first thing that came to mind when you read that article? Doubt. Okay, what else? Tsun <laughs> uh, Anything else? Scam. What? What? Oh, we, yeah, happy people. They only survey happy people only. You know, it's, it was quite interesting, right? This was, this was met with a, a bunch of mixed results. I mean, people were, were very confused. Uh, who, who came out of this survey? Uh, who did they survey? And, and the thing that entertained me the most when I am bored, uh, one of the things I like to do is find articles and read the comments. Uh, the comments is like a black hole, man. Like you go in, you never come out. Uh, sometimes it does good to your life, sometimes it doesn't. But, but some of the comments were quite uh, amazing and it's quite interesting. So I, I thought I'll just pull out a few uh, for us today. One, one of them said, you know, uh, oh, I can't even read what I wrote. Uh, it is more accurate to say that Singapore is the least miserable country in Asia uh, as opposed to the happiest. Um, another one said, you know, I wonder who they actually polled to get that absolutely outrageous conclusion. Another one said, what a joke. Uh, and then another one said, every Singaporean is going to wonder if they're the only one who is unhappy uh, after, after reading this article. And, and it's quite interesting, right? It was met with a, a range of different things. Now, some people had positive things to say, like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe it's because uh, we were very entitled. That's why we don't think we're happy when actually we sh there are so many reasons why we should be happy. But as I was... Looking through that article, something stirred with my own heart because I, I will tell you, when, when, I, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, actually not bad, huh? well, we, we're, we're top. Uh, I mean, Singapore doesn't settle for second huh? or anything else. We, we always want to be first. And, and I was actually quite grateful. Huh? I, I could look back and, and say, you know what, actually, there are many reasons why we can be happy. Now, are there things that can be improved? Are there things that can be better? Uh, definitely, as with every other country in the world, even the top country in this list, there were things that could have been improved on. There were things that could have been worked out of. And, and again, as I was just reflecting on this, uh, back then and even in the last few weeks, uh, it kind of brought me back to this truth. It revealed something within us because the reality is this, we're all pursuing happiness of some sort. Whether you believe it or not, you're, you're trying to have a happy life, you're trying to be joyful, you're trying to experience good things, you're working towards those things. Why are you working hard in your job so that you can be happy? Does working in your job make you happy? Let's not do a poll uh, because we don't know what you're going to get. Uh, be careful what you wish for. And yet at that same time, why do we do it? We do it because we're trying to get something else to make us happy. Not just us, but to make our families happy, to make our nation happy, to, to make the people around us happy. And yet, as with this reaction to this article, there is a truth that we see in the pursuit of happiness. You see, the pursuit of happiness either leaves you wanting more or fearful of losing what you already have. It's actually quite interesting. There have been multiple studies done on the pursuit of happiness and how it makes people feel. And some studies in the recent years have actually shown that instead of making you happy, the pursuit of happiness can actually make you more unhappy. Uh, that it can actually leave you feeling more stressed, leave you feeling a bit more disappointed than if you were not pursuing happiness. Now, what are we trying to say here? Are we trying to say then, then let's stop pursuing happiness? N not really, because we have to recognize again that this is a reality of life. We are all pursuing happiness happiness in some way, shape, or form. The question that we have to ask, though, is what does the Bible have to say about this pursuit? Because, again, if you look back at your life and if we are honest with ourselves, the pursuit of happiness will fall in one of these two categories. It doesn't matter how much we have, you can always get more. In fact, no matter how much you get, you may feel like there's something lacking which pushes you to keep getting more so that you can be more happy. But in that same time, sometimes if we are content with what we have and we're already happy, 
then there is something innate within us that is afraid of losing it because the moment we lose it, we become unhappy. And that in itself drives us to do certain things. Now, what do we do with this pursuit of happiness? What does the Bible have to say? How are we to respond? Do we then say, you know what, maybe we should go to the camp that says, why shoot for the moon when you just land up in the dirt? or you can't even land among the stars. Let's just have no goals in life. Let's have no more pursuits. And let's just be content where we are. Is that the way that we are to live? No, because that's not what the Bible calls us to. He, the Bible calls us to a life of purpose. The Bible calls us to a life of pursuit. But again, the question is, what does the Bible have to say about the pursuit of happiness? And so for the rest of our time together today and for the following weeks, we're going to be addressing this question and we're going to try and unpack it for us. What does the pursuit of happiness look like for a Christian life, in a Christian life? And what example should we set for others around us? And we actually see the Bible addresses this idea and concept of happiness and joy all throughout the Scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. And to start us off today, we're going to dive into both, okay? The Old Testament and the New Testament. And this is going to kind of lay the foundation for us and the rest of our time together. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, this is something which is not unfamiliar to us. Um, The Bible says this, Then he said to them, and this is Nehemiah, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, what is God trying to say to us about the pursuit of joy and the pursuit of happiness? Well, we see that, number one, the first thing that we recognize is that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, again, we don't just see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New. Because in John chapter 15, verse 9 to 11, Jesus says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love, and if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Now these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now why are we starting out our time with these two passages? Because I believe that these two passages are the key to the pursuit of happiness and joy in our lives. As you begin to understand the two passages, you begin to see a very common thread a common truth that threads these two passages together, and it's this, it's that our joy is intrinsically linked to the joy of God. Our joy is intrinsically linked to the joy of God. You see, there is nothing wrong with pursuing joy. There's nothing wrong with pursuing happiness. The question we have to ask ourselves, though, is whose joy and whose happiness are we pursuing? If we're pursuing our happiness, we've missed it because our joy cannot be made complete without the joy of God. Again, John chapter 15. If my joy is in you, so that your joy may be full. In other words, if the joy of God is not in you, your joy will never be full. The same thing. If the joy of the Lord is not your strength, then you have no strength without His joy. The challenge, though, is that in the journey of life, we are very often caught up in the pursuit of our joy, in the pursuit of our happiness, in the pursuit of the joy of others around us, in the pursuit of the happiness of others around us, all the while missing this important truth that without pursuing the joy of God, we will never be able to have the fullness of joy within us. Without God's joy, there can be no true joy. And that's why for the series that we have lined up for us this month, we're going to be talking about and answering this question, what brings God joy? You see, if we truly want to experience joy in our lives, we must first do things so that God will be joyful. We must first bring God joy. The key to bringing joy into your life is to bring God joy first. Because without the joy of the Lord, there can be no joy. And we need to understand this. Because 
if we don't know what brings God joy, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how hard we try. If we miss it, we miss it. You may be doing something that you think brings God joy and it doesn't. Just because your intent is right before God doesn't mean that you're bringing Him joy. In the same way, there are certain things that Amanda likes. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated our 10th anniversary, wedding anniversary. And, and there are things that she likes, which I don't necessarily like. Uh, but if I try to do things that I like to bring her joy that she doesn't like, it doesn't matter how right my heart is and my motivation is, it's not bringing her joy. In fact, it may bring her frustration. Now, there are times where I do things to bring her joy and a part of me dies on the inside, right? But why do I do it? Because I bring her joy. And as I bring her joy, she brings me joy, right? It, it, it's the same thing when it comes to God. We must understand and recognize what brings God joy so that we can bring, live a life that brings Him joy. And in turn, as we begin to see the joy of God and the evidence of His joy, it begins to fill our hearts with joy as well. See, the question is, which or whose joy are you pursuing? It's the first question that I believe God's asking each and every one of us today. Because if we continue to pursue just our joy and the joy of others, we would have missed it completely. You will never be able to find fullness of joy. And until you come to this revelation and this realization that you need the joy of God within you, then it leads us to the second question, which is what brings God joy. And so for the rest of our time today, we're going to be trying to answer this question and for the following weeks as well. But for today, we're going to be diving into the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. Because we're going to kind of start out from the first passage that we read, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. Now you have to understand the context of what that's, what's going on within that to begin to see what brought joy to God in that situation, which then brought strength to the people so that they could live in the joy of God, thus living in their own joy as well. So we're going to be reading from verse 1 all the way to verse 12. And, and it's quite interesting because this is in the context of them actually coming before God in repentance. This is the context of them actually being read out the law of Moses. And so reading from verse 1, it says this, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood a whole bunch of people whose names I will not attempt to pronounce. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. Oh man, we should have gotten everybody to stand. Now my next time. Uh, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen. Lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, a whole bunch of other people whose names I will not read. Um, the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. God bless the reading of His Word. 
You know, from this passage, we see four things that we need to do in order to bring God joy. Four things that the people of Israel did that brought God joy. And in turn, as God's joy was brought unto him, his strength was released into the hearts of the people of Israel. And as we unpack these four things together, this is going to kind of challenge us and convict us to come back to this place of asking this question, how are we doing with these four things? How are we bringing God joy in these four things? And where is, or where am I at in this place of joy as it relates to these four things? The first thing that we see, and it's quite interesting because all four things actually relate to the law. All four things relate to the word. The first thing that the people of Israel did that brought God joy was that they, had, they paid attention to the word of God. Can I tell you, for every single one of you here today, every Sunday, your presence here brings God joy. But your presence here is not enough. Your attention to His Word is what brings God's joy. AKA, if you're on your phone playing game, Ooh, I don't know if that brings God joy. If you're hearing the words that come out of my mouth, but it's not really going into your ear, and you're not really listening, it's in one and out the other, you're not really bringing God joy. You see, going through the motion of hearing a word is not enough to bring God joy. And sometimes we come to church every day, or not, oh, every day, oh, man, that would be so good, like, you come to church every day. Uh, if you go to church every week and you're not really paying attention to the Word and you're just going through the motion and then you go back home and you, and, and you go through life as it is and you wonder to yourself, why have I yet to experience the joy of God? Maybe it's simply because you have yet to start paying attention to the Word. In fact, it's quite interesting when you read this passage here, you know how long they paid attention to the Word of God? This convicted me, man. Six hours at least. Don't believe me? Let's, let's pay attention to the word. Lah. Right? I mean, you, you go to verse 3. He read it from early morning, a.k.a. dawn, until midday. Isn't it amazing? The people managed to pay attention. And they, didn't just, they weren't just present because the Bible again says this in verse 3. And the years of all the people were attentive for six hours. I'll be completely honest, I don't know if I can preach for six hours. And I also don't know if you can listen to me preach for six hours. But as they paid attention to the Word of God, they were so gripped by the Word of God that it brought God joy. Now, I'm in no way, shape, or form saying that we have, there's a minimum amount of time we must pay attention to God, then He'll be joyful, lah. Because that's, that's really going too far into this. But it begs this question. For many of us here, sometimes it's even hard to set aside five minutes a day to pay attention to the Word of God. Let alone six hours. And then here we are wondering, why are we not happy with life? Why are we not joyful in every circumstance? Why do we find it so hard to rejoice in the Lord always? Why do we find it so hard? And again, it comes back to this question. Have you been bringing God joy? Because it's in the joy of the Lord that you will find your joy. And then we say, oh, but how do we bring God joy? Well, again, have you been paying attention to the Word? You see, if we've not been paying attention to the Word and yet we've been wanting and we've been desiring to experience the fullness of joy, something is missing in between because one of the ways in which we can bring God joy and thus experience His joy in our lives is by paying attention to the Word. We have to pay attention to the Word of God. Now, we don't just see it in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 2 to 3, but we see it in Psalm 119, verse 111. You see, your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. We are to take delight in the Word of God. We are to pay attention to His Word. We are to read it. In another version, in the message version, it says this, I inherited your book on living, and it brings me great joy. 
You see, it's, it's recognizing and understanding that the Word of God, as we pay attention to it, as we read it, as we set aside time to look into the Word of God, that that is what brings God joy. Well, it's one of the things that brings Him joy. And when it brings Him joy, it brings us joy in return. And so the first thing that we see is an attention to the Word. The second thing, though, that we see is that it wasn't just an attention to the Word, but there was an understanding of the Word. Again, we see it in the passage that we just read, not just in verse 7 to 8, but even early on, that they brought all who could understand what they heard and they stood there to pay attention to the Word of God. See, he even took time to, to get the people to, to teach the Word so that they would have full understanding of what was being spoken. Why? Because it's not just our mere attention to the Word that brings God's joy, it's our understanding of the Word. We have to be able to understand. Now, what are we... I'll just kind of use our senses and our body as an example of this. To pay attention to the Word of God is to focus on Him with our eyes and our ears. Do we even hear what He's saying? Do we even see what He's doing? You see, it's one thing to know what He is doing and to see it. It's another thing to understand what it actually means. But you cannot have understanding without first seeing. Without first being aware of what the Word actually says, you can't actually understand it. Now, this is why, again, it is so important for us. If you want to experience joy in your life, if you want to bring God joy in and through your life, it's not enough to just read the Word of God. That's why five minutes, it's a start, but five minutes is not enough because there is a call for us to study the Word of God. Studying the Word of God is not just for Bible school students. Studying the Word of God is for Jesus students, of which we are all students. Why? To be a Jesus student just means to be a disciple of Christ. We are to study the Word of God. We cannot settle for just being for just paying attention to the Word, for just reading it every once in a while. We need to study it. We need to seek to understand what it means. What does this look like for us? This means that when we read the Word of God, that we seek to understand it in its original context, in its original meaning. Can the Bible mean anything it wants to say? No. The Bible means what the Bible means. What the Bible originally intended to say, that's what Jesus and God is trying to say to us. And it is our job to begin to study and dive into the Word of God together. Not just to be so quick to see how it applies to me, but to first ask the question, what was God trying to say to the people in that context? And as we dig that out for ourselves, we begin to then bridge it to our lives to begin to understand what He's trying to say to us today. That's one of the reasons why we gather every Sunday to read the Word. So that for, for better or for worse, somebody else does the studying for you. But it's not enough for just somebody else to study it for you. We need to study it for ourselves. That's why we try to teach us, even in our life groups and in our different Christian education classes, how we can study the Bible, how we can read it, how we can know what it's trying to say, because all of us are called to read it for ourselves. All of us are called to seek understanding by ourselves. We are responsible for our own understanding of the Word of God. Again, we see this throughout the Bible in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. And I sense again, as in this pursuit of happiness and this pursuit of joy, one of the questions God is asking us is, where are we at in this journey of wisdom and understanding? How much do we actually know about the Bible? How much do we understand? How much do we understand about what God is calling us to do? Some of us may understand what He's trying to call us to do, but we don't have the the backing of it. They'll say, hey, so how do you know that this is what God wants you to do? Well, I heard pastor say it. Lah. But where is it in the scriptures? Oh, I'm not really sure. Can I tell you, we are living in a day and age where to study the Bible is at one of its easiest. It's the easiest to study Bible. Why? Because you've got Google. Now, you can't believe everything Google tells you, but yet the information out there is vast. That's why it's so important for us as we seek understanding in the Word is to do our own research, to do our own study, but to also come back into community to share what we have so that iron can sharpen iron. You see, understanding and wisdom does not happen in a vacuum. It happens within the context of community. We see it again in Nehemiah chapter 8. They didn't just get understanding just by themselves. Now, they had the responsibility and it was their own, 
but they got it as they gathered together. This is why I want to encourage you, if, if you didn't sign up for, if you haven't signed up for our Christian education class, go sign up for it. Why? Because it's one way in which we can gain understanding. If you don't know what it's about, it just goes to show that's why we need to go to find out what it's about. We need to be equipped. If someone came up to you and they were hungry for the gospel of Jesus and they asked you, what does this mean? How does this relate to the culture of the day? Right? That's, the, that's the topic that we're going to be looking at for, for the next two weekends over our Christian education class. And if you said, man, that's such a great question. I don't really know. Let me get back to you. Imagine if before you could get back to them, all of a sudden, the time was up on earth. You see, we have a responsibility to reap the harvest when the harvest is ready. There's something that farmers do, right? They know that when the harvest comes, there is a very specific window in which you can reap the harvest. The moment you fail to reap it within that window, the harvest is gone. It dies. In that same way, this is why for us, every Christian, every son and daughter of the Most High God, we have a responsibility to seek understanding, not just for ourselves, but so that we will be ready in season and out of season to reap the harvest. Sometimes as Christians, we like to console ourselves with spiritual truths. Like, if I don't do it, God will raise another to do it. And we like to use Esther, lah, Queen Esther as an example. But we fail to see that while that is true, there are also times where it's too late. We have a responsibility to seek the Word, to understand it, so that we can be f better grounded in our faith, but also so that we can share that truth with others around us, to help them see that our faith is not without understanding, that our faith is not without reason. They come together. It's holistic. And so how can we start? in this place of bringing God joy through the understanding of the Word. I want to encourage you if, you, if you don't read your Bible, start. If you've already started reading your Bible and not started to study it, study. If you don't know how to study, come and find somebody to teach you and, and, and walk with you. If, no, if you don't know anybody who knows how to study it, then find somebody to try and figure it out together. I mean, there is always something that we can do to bring us closer to this place of bringing God joy. And in turn, again, I promise you this. Are there times where you do these things and you don't find joy in your life? Yes. Why? Because we're human. All fall short. But I tell you, if we press in and as we persevere in doing these things, the day will come where we will truly experience the joy of the Lord. This is why the enemy has massive pushback when it comes to reading the Bible, studying the Bible, because he knows that if we push past a certain point and we learn to enjoy it, he can't stop us anymore. So, what can we do? Study the Bible. What can we do? Go for CE class. This is why we're trying to beef up our Christian education classes in church. In the second half of the year, we're going to be, having a, we're going to be rolling out a new Christian education track that we want every Calvary to go and be a part of because we believe that this is one of the ways. It's not the only way, okay? It's one of the ways in which, as a church, we can be who God has called us to be, not just within the four walls of the church, but outside the four walls of the church. In order for us to do that, we must first gain understanding together. And so I want to encourage you, we need to set this apart. We need to prioritize this. Many people prioritize understanding so many other things in life. Right? We go for causes to upskill. We send our kids for tuition, sometimes at the expense of church. Right? And, and, and we fail to see that we're so good at doing all these things to pursue joy and happiness and success in all these other areas of life, while yet missing out on the fact that if we pursue those things within the faith and God, all these things will be added unto us. It doesn't mean that we slacken off on those things. It means that as we do them together with God at the center, 
Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added. And yet, time and time again, we find ourselves stuck. Why are we unhappy? Why are we discontent? Maybe it's because we've not paid attention to the Word. Maybe it's because we lack understanding of the Word. The other thing that we can do, though, to gain understanding is if you're not plugged in a life group, I encourage and I exhort you. I plead with you. It's not to make me feel good. It's not to show that we've got many people in a life group. No, it's because we believe that it's only within community that we can truly grow to be who God has called us to be. Now, is there hurt? Is there brokenness in community? Yes, there is, absolutely. But it's in the midst of that that God can still mold us and shape us to be who He has called us to be. How do we know this? If you want to follow Jesus, was Jesus hurt and broken? A hundred percent, yes. Follow Him. Follow Him and see the joy of the Lord fulfilled in your life. And so two things so far, to pay attention to the Word and to gain understanding of the Word. The third thing that we see the people of Israel do that brought joy to God, that in turn gave strength to them and brought them joy was the conviction of the Word of God within their lives. You see, it's not enough to just pay attention. It's not enough to just understand. Again, remember, to pay attention is like the eyes and the ears. What are you looking at? What are you focusing on? To understand is to catch the Word of God within your mind, to understand it for yourself, the knowledge. The conviction of the Word represents the heart's response to the Word. You see, the people of Israel, as they paid attention for six hours, I can tell you this, like, if they weren't convicted, they wouldn't pay attention for six hours. It's, it's one of those things. But we see this conviction on a few levels, even through the passage of Scripture that we, that we see. Number one, and it's not in verse six, the first thing that we see is that they were convicted that God's word was true. They were convicted that God was holy. And this was made manifest in the way that they responded after the reading of the word. The moment the word was being read, they said, amen, amen. And amen is not just a word Christians say. Amen was, they were actually saying, let it be. Let it be, which means that we believe every word that has come out of that mouth, we believe every word that has been read, and we declare, let it be so in our lives. You see, sometimes we've lost the significance of the word amen. It's become so commonplace that we forget that when we say amen, we're actually saying, Lord, your will be done, not mine. It means, God, let me die to myself so that I can live for Christ. If we truly understood what it meant, we may hear less amens in the church. Lord, send me, I will go, amen. See, it'll be like that, quiet. Right, because, because we have to wrestle with this place. Are we convicted? It was the conviction of their lives that led them to this place of declaring and worshipping God. But it wasn't just that they were convicted by the truth of the Word of God and that He was holy. They were also convicted of the fact that they had fallen short. That's why they repented. That's why they were grieving. Again, it's so interesting because the place of the joy of the Lord will be your strength came in the midst of their grief and mourning. They were crying halfway and then Nehemiah stood up and said, this is not the time to be grieving. But why were they grieved? They were grieved because they understood that they had fallen short of the glory of God. It was a godly grief. And in that same way, we have to ask ourselves this. Maybe we understand the word. Maybe we paid attention and we understand it. The question is, has the word traveled from our head to our hearts? Are we convicted by the Word of God? Does it compel us? Does it grip our hearts? Are we filled with passion? Sometimes we're so mechanical as a church that it fails to bring God joy because we're just going through the motion, because we're just doing it because we have to. There's a difference between doing it because you have to and doing it because you want to. Does this mean we stop doing it if we have to? No, because the heart is deceitful above all else. It doesn't matter what your heart tells you. What matters is what the Word tells you. We submit to the Word, not to our hearts. But this truth also comes, is that if we continue to do what we have to, God will do a work of transformation within our hearts to the place where we will want to. It's the conviction of the Word. We see this again in Job chapter 5, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man 
whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. This means that we must mark ourselves with humility. A humility to submit ourselves to the Word of God. A humility that kills pride. Because sometimes when we read the Word, or when someone comes up to preach and it rubs us the wrong way, but it's the Word of God, the first thing that happens is that pride stirs up and pride causes us to defend our position. No, la, they must be reading the word wrong. La. No, la, that's not for me, that's for somebody else. In fact, sometimes pride doesn't just defend, pride deflects. Wow, this is such a good word for the person next to me, man. They need to pay attention to the word of God. But in thinking that, you're really not paying attention. La, right? but, but we're so quick to do that. Self-righteousness kicks in. Why? Because we're, sometimes we're afraid of being convicted by the word of God. You know why? Sometimes we're afraid of being convicted because we know that the moment we are convicted, it may cost us something. Because we've read it too many times in the Bible. Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac. I mean, we know he didn't do it at the end of the day, but he had to go through that trauma. Jesus died on the cross. The fishermen gave up their jobs. Now, it's not always the case, but yet we see the pattern. That there are times where obedience requires sacrifice. And so sometimes we're afraid of being convicted because we're afraid of the inconvenience that that might bring to us. But let me tell you, a life without conviction is a life that fails to bring God joy. A life that is void of conviction it's a life that fails to bring God joy. Do you know why? Oh, let me rephrase it. Do you know what could possibly be the biggest hindrance to people coming into the kingdom of God? Indifferent Christians. Because when people look at indifferent Christians and they see a life without conviction, the message that is communicating is that God is a God who is void of any conviction and passion. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. This is why it's so important for us to live a life of conviction. Because a life of conviction brings God joy. But the fourth thing that we see that brings God joy it's not just conviction. It's not just what we pay attention to with our eyes and our ears. It's not just understanding with our minds and our head. It's not just about how we feel within our heart and, and, and how we are sold out for the glory of God. It's about what we do with our hands. It's the obedience to the Word. See, the people of Israel, they didn't just spend six hours paying attention to the Word of God. They didn't just spend six hours trying to understand what it meant. They did just respond with conviction and just say, oh, amen, amen, hallelujah, we worship you. And they didn't just cry before God and say, God, we're so sorry and we're so grieved. And isn't that beautiful? Because we did that last weekend. But that's not enough. It's what they did after. They had to walk in obedience. And they walked in obedience in two ways, two things that God had called them to do, that they actually walked out. And I believe it was because of that that the joy of the Lord was fulfilled. In two ways. Number one, it was to rejoice and walk in God's forgiveness and restoration. See, the reason why God called them to come up and to celebrate and to eat and to drink and to be merry is because it was the time of the festival of the booths. Now, the festival of the booths is one of the big celebrations for the Jews in that time. It was to commemorate Passover and the deliverance from Egypt, right? getting out of Egypt. It was to thank God for His provision and to continue to declare the provision of God in their lives. It was a time of celebration and festivity. They weren't actually supposed to be mourning. And God saw that they were in mourning. God saw that they were grieved for good reason because they were convicted by the Word of God. And God said, now, 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 now is not the time for this day is holy. This day has been set apart. It's the festival of the booths. So you need to celebrate. And so you have to understand is they were already grieved. For them to switch all of a sudden from grieving to celebration and rejoicing 
was a very intentional thing that they needed to do, where they had to recognize that the forgiveness and restoration of God was already made complete in their lives. That's why they could celebrate with joy in the festival of the booth. They had to step out of that. And in that same way, I sense that there are some of us here, maybe we're still living in the bondage of God, not bondage of God, the bondage of sin. And God is saying, the time for grieving is over. It's time to walk in the freedom that has already been purchased for you from sin. To walk in the fullness of all that it is that I have for you. There are some who are still unwilling to, to serve and, and to minister to others. God is saying, no, 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 the time is now for you to walk in obedience, to serve the people around you, to love them, to minister to them. Because the second thing, so the first was that they were to walk in freedom, they were to walk in the joy of God, even if they didn't feel like it. They were to walk in it. Because again, they were grieving. They were grieving not just for their generation, they were grieving for the generations beyond. And I think that is something we will never understand in our day and age today. We don't understand what it means to grieve for the generations that have gone before us. But it was something which was very real for them. But the second thing in which they obeyed was that the Bible tells us, calls them, right, eat, drink, and be merry. So they obeyed. They ate, they drank, and they were merry. Even though they felt like mourning and they felt like weeping and they felt like repenting. But the other thing that they did was God told them to send portions and to make great rejoicing. And they sent portions. Now, what does this mean? There were some people who didn't have enough. And so what God was saying, okay, now what you need to do is in the same way that I provided for you in Egypt and out of Egypt, you need to provide for those who have none so that they can join you in this rejoicing. This means that he was calling them to walk in obedience in the place of justice and mercy and ministry to the rest of the body. Not just the body, but even the foreigners amongst them, which is the people who, are not, who have yet to be engrafted into their branch. What does this mean for us? One of the ways in which we can bring God joy is to, number one, walk in the freedom that God has called us to. Every time you fall into sin, I mean, this is, this is not rocket science. Every time you fall into sin, that does not bring God joy. But every time you walk in freedom, it brings God joy. But the second thing is, it's not just for you, it's for the people around you. Every time you serve your fellow man or woman, within the church, outside the church, every time you minister to them, every time you pray for them, it brings God joy. If as a church we began to adopt and foster children, I tell you what, it will bring God joy something that we will work towards. In fact, as I'm preaching this, if you feel led to do something like that, come and find me. Let's bring God joy together as a body of Christ. As we continue to bless the community, it brings God joy. You see, it's not enough to just think it. It's not enough to just plan it. We have to walk in it. And this is why, again, with the two passages that we started out with, Nehemiah chapter 8 and John chapter 15, it's so beautiful because when you go back to John chapter 15, verse 9 to 11, and with this, I want to invite the worship team to come up and join me. As Jesus talks about his joy being made complete, what brought Jesus joy? What brought the joy of Christ into the lives of his disciples? Again, if you look at John 15, verse 9, it starts out with, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. You see, Jesus Himself, the Son of God, He understood that the way or the requirement for His joy to be in us is that we must first walk in obedience. We must first walk in obedience. What is God saying to us today? If you want to pursue a life of joy, it has to start with pursuing the joy of God.
See, the key to our joy is to pursue the joy of God wholeheartedly. Like I mentioned, it's not enough to just pay attention with our eyes and our ears. We have to gain understanding with our mind. It's not enough to gain understanding with our mind. We have to allow it to come down into our hearts. It's not enough to just feel the tugging of God's word on our hearts. It has to translate into what we do with our hands. A life of obedience. Can I tell you, in every situation, we will be faced with this crossroad. Do we pursue our joy or do we pursue the joy of God? And as we make it a commitment to practice the joy of God in every moment, I believe then and only then will we experience the fullness of His joy. And it doesn't have to be something big. It doesn't have to be something massive like giving up your job and then going into the mission field. If God so leads you in that direction, we rejoice and we will journey with you in that. But, but it starts from the little things. Just to kind of give us an example, I remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, it, was, it was kind of like a long day or uh, I was just trying to recover from everything that's going on uh, the last few weeks. And, and so we went a bit early-ish, I think maybe about 10-ish. And then all of a sudden, my phone rang. So my phone is always uh, not on silent. So if you only need to call me and I just call, uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll answer. Uh, it, it's been like that ever since, even before I entered full time. Because there was a part of me that, that I, I understood that, that God's on call 24-7, so His people should be. So my phone rang, my phone rang at 1 a.m., Every time my phone rings, because it doesn't ring very often in the middle of the night, uh, thank you all for your kind consideration and love. Uh, but okay, don't let it stop you. <laughs> uh, so normally when it rings, I think it's my alarm, but it, it's a different ringtone. So very quickly, I, I knew that it was my phone and I looked at it and it was an unknown number. And the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, spam. Uh, I, I had this thing running, running through my head. It doesn't happen often, but it did. Oh God, but I just want to sleep, man. Like, swala, if it's important, they'll call again. Right? Let, maybe I don't answer. I'll make it silent. <laughs> right? And, and if it's important, they'll call again. Uh, yeah. But there was something tugging in my heart. No, I just pick up the phone. So I picked up the phone. Somebody called, like, and it was somebody that I. I'll be honest. When I heard the person, I was like, oh man, this person does not bring me joy. I was like, oh, why did I pick up the phone? And they were in need of help, lah, essentially. To cut the long story short, it required me to travel, lah, to get out of my bed, to get to my car, and to meet them where they were at about 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. Lah. And, and as I was there, the tussle and the struggle was real, man. I was like, Amanda woke up, and she was like, so how do you need to go? I was like, oh, I don't know. I, let's see, let's see. I tried what I could to try not to have to go. And, and at the end of it, I felt compelled to go. And so I went. Let me tell you, every time I had this debate in my head, right? You know what would have made me happy? To sleep. Chop stem, like, to sleep. But I knew that what would God make God happy was to go. So I went. I drove there to, I mean, some other things happened, which... I don't know whether it made me more happy or not happy. Uh, and, and I chose to walk in obedience to God. And when I went home, it was so strange. When I went home, I, was, I felt so fulfilled. In fact, it took me longer than I thought it would have for me to fall back to sleep. I was a bit annoyed by that. I was like, ah, I should just sleep. But I was, I was so filled and, and, and so full of... I don't think God's joy is the right word, but I was just fulfilled. I knew that I had done what God wanted me to do. I was happy that I actually went out to do it. Although the journey there may not have been the happiest for me. In that simple moment, reminds me of the need and the importance of pursuing the joy of God wholeheartedly. In every situation, in every season, maybe there are people in your workplace that you despise. 
And maybe for you, despise is even a word which doesn't even compare to what you really feel. And that's why you're so miserable at work. Can I tell you, pursue the joy of God. Love them. Ah, oh, love them. Are you, are you kidding? That makes me even more miserable. Yes, I know. But your mourning will only be for a moment. His joy will be a lifetime. Trust Him. For others, you've got so many other things to do and you're trying to pursue the things that are set before you. There are deadlines to meet. There are things that you have to clear. And you know that if you don't do it, then you may get set back in life. And because of that, there are times in which the Word of God and the pursuit of God, it's joy, gets cast aside. Can I encourage you today that if you ever think it is impossible to do both, that is a lie from the enemy. Because the enemy knows that if you choose to give up one, you give up God. Pursue both. And if on the off chance you had to give up one, trust God. For when His joy is in you, your joy will be full. And so wherever we are today, I, I just sense that this is God's word for us. Whose joy are you pursuing? And where are we in this place of pursuing the joy of God in our lives? And so Father, we want to thank you for your word today. God, we thank you that Lord, you've said it in Nehemiah, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. That you're not a man that you should lie. And so we pray that that truth will become a reality in each and every one of our hearts. But as a church, God, I pray that you will turn our hearts to you. Help us to pursue your joy above all else knowing that it's in your joy that our joy will be made complete. And so as we take the next few moments to respond to you today, Father, come and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed. No, I just sense God opening up a time for us to respond. Maybe there are some of us here uh, unfulfilled is the word that you would use to describe your life. There is no joy or there is a lack of joy. And you've tried. It's not like it's a lack of trying. You've tried to do so many things and it's always seemed to fall short. And as you were listening to the word, you're asking yourself this question, is this really true? Can I really experience this joy by pursuing His joy? I sense God wants to just affirm his word in your life today. And if that's you and you say, God, I God, I want your joy in my life. God, I want to live a life that brings joy to you. Teach me what that looks like. Then wherever you are in this place, will you just lift up your hand and, and put it down in an act of committing yourself to God to say, God, I want to pursue your joy. I see that hand, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. The second group that I just want to speak to today is maybe there is that you evaluate where you are in this life of the four things that we talked about that brings God joy. You know that you're lacking in one or two or three or maybe all four of these areas. 
and you just want to make a commitment to, to grow in those areas, or maybe even just one, then the days ahead. Wherever you are, we just put up your hand in an act of just saying, God, here I am. God, give me a heart for your word. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand again, yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Now, with all of us standing wherever we are, let's just stand all across this place. You know, in the next few moments, the worship team's going to lead us in a song of response. And, and what I want to do is I just want to open up the altars. Maybe God's been speaking to you, drawing you into this place. Maybe you responded earlier with the lifting of your hands. You know, I want you to know that God wants to meet with you today. That God wants to speak into your heart. Maybe it's something that's not even related to the message for today, but you need prayer in a certain area because that area is hindering you from experiencing the joy of God. You know, we just want to come alongside you to pray together. Why do we do this? Why do we open up the altars? Because I believe that it is one of the ways that brings God joy because it's walking in obedience to Him. The Bible calls us to pray for one another, to encourage each other every time we gather. And that's why as a church, we we have this time for us to just come before God. I want to just kind of dispel uh, a fallacy that maybe we have. People, there is nothing wrong with people who come to the altar. <laughs> can, can we just say it like blatantly? It's not because they're lousy, it's not because they don't have God. It's, in fact, there's something right <laughs> Because God's doing something in your life. It's something that should be celebrated. It's something that, that we should embrace. It's something that brings God joy. And so as the worship team begins to lead us, come on, will we just spend the next few moments responding to God? If we need prayer, if we want to just come up to the front, we want to respond to God and say, God, here we are. We want to commit to pursuing your joy. Will we just come and, and respond to Him together? Oh, Rabbi,